to admit my humanity today and sit to preach to you. I'm so sorry. If you can't see me, I assume there's enough room for you to scooch down your pew and do so. I was sick this week, and I did not take care of myself enough yesterday, so... Uh, recognizing I still have another worship and a consistory meeting after this, I'm going to preserve a little bit of energy by sitting down for the next few minutes. I hope you can understand and give me grace. Listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory be to you, O Lord. He also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day. And the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself. First the stalk, then the head, and the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. This is the good news. Praise to you, Lord Spreading the gospel can be discouraging. Believe me, despite my perceived constant optimism, I of all people understand that spreading the gospel can be discouraging. I labor with the word for hours most weeks, seeking the message for you of God, Christ's seeking a message for this group of Christ's gathered people in this time and in this place. I have the courage to do it each week because each time I set myself to it, the Spirit shows up. And by bedtime on Saturday night, I can't wait to share with you all the many jewels the Spirit has given me to share. And most weeks I do get a few positive comments in return. But the fact remains, little seems to change. Just like most churches, with the exception of this Sunday, our attendance dwindles, especially among our younger generations. I can get loud, and I can get quiet, and I can even dance around. But some will inevitably still fall asleep. And even if my sermons are light, many of the other works of the community of Christ come only after powerful persuading and plentiful pleas of please, please, please. It can be discouraging. And I know it's not just the clergy, but every sister and brother in the family of Christ may easily find cause to get discouraged. Some of you are in the business of sharing your faith with your family and friends and co-workers. In today's world, it's more and more common to be outright ridiculed for being Christian, assumed to be very suspicious if you try to share your faith and the joy it brings you, the people you love, the people you hold out hope for, that they might find the fullness and freedom you have. Not only do they seem to not care, but to breach the subject in some settings, we might be met with suspicion or even anger. Some might accuse us of trying to be patronizing, when all we want to do is help. It can be very discouraging. The parable for today offers hope to those who take the time to share their faith with others. This parable teaches us that the gospel seed has power. This parable teaches us that while we may <coughs> never see immediate results from our efforts, the gospel will bear fruit in God's time. When the gospel is shared, whether from the pulpit sitting in a chair, or from a personal witness, a mysterious process begins to take place. That process is the sovereign work of God. The process is most often hidden from our view, yet it results in changed lives, new life, the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus depicts a farmer sowing seed into 
to his field. When he has sowed the seed, he has done all that he can do. He returns home and goes about his business. The image of him sleeping and rising night and day, it's the picture of the farmer living his life. He places the seed in the soil and he leaves it to do what it will. For the farmer, this is a work of faith. He does not return to the field every day to dig up the seed to see if it has germinated. He may water the field. He may remove the weeds. He may keep the soil worked up. But he does not bother the seed. After it has been planted, the farmer has no control over what it does. He sows the seed and leaves the results in the hands of God. The farmer knows that the growth of the seed is God's business. Therefore, he sows it and trusts the Lord to make it grow. The farmer's task is to sow. When he's done that, he has fulfilled his primary duty. We are like that farmer. We are called to sow seed. We have been called to sow the gospel seed into the hearts of other people. We have been sent to a lost and dying world to tell others about what Jesus has done for us. You may not be a preacher, a missionary, or a pastor, but if you are here, you have a testimony. If you are here, you have been changed by the grace of God, and you have a story to tell. You have a story to tell. And for me, that's one of the simplest beauties we find in our scriptural witness. Think for a moment about the Bible. Our Bible is full of stories. Our Bible is full of people who are changed by the stories of others. Paul certainly is an amazing example our most famous evangelist. He was completely transformed by Christ, even taking on a new name. And he spent the rest of his life telling everyone he could his story. Peter's first letter says to always be ready to answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. The hope you have comes from the way Christ has changed you. That's your story. And sharing that is spreading the gospel seed. When we share the gospel with another person, we have no control over the results. In fact, the results aren't even our worry. Our duty only is to sow the seed. The results are in the hands of the Lord. It's hard. We all worry about our efforts. There's always temptation to check on that seed. Is it growing? Is it growing? We want to help it grow and check on its progress. Our responsibility is to sow the seed. Water it when we can. We let the Lord do the work in the hearts and lives of others. Like the farmer in the parable, we should be faithful to tell a lost world about a saving Jesus, a saving Christ. If you are a witness for the Lord Jesus, keep sharing his story with others. Often the best way is just telling your story of how being a Christian has changed or shaped you. God will honor your efforts. If you aren't, sowing the seed as you should be, then I challenge you to make a personal commitment today to get busy doing what the Lord changed you to do. Notice the farmer does have other business he goes about. Being a disciple is more than evangelizing, but living grace through mission, Concrete care for the least among us and the like, 
The farmer sows the seed and goes about his other business. And an amazing thing happens. The earth that appears to be dead suddenly begins to show signs of life. One day there's nothing in the field but dirt. And the next day, little sprouts everywhere. As the days pass, the blade appears. Then the ear is formed, and eventually in the ear, row upon row of corn. It's all a complete mystery of the farmer, how it really happens. All he did was sow some seed into the barren earth, and now he's about to reap a harvest. He can't see or understand the process of the seed going on underground. All in all he knows is he's about to benefit from the secret work. Now modern science has made some amazing discoveries in our lifetime. Scientists can take a seed apart and analyze its structure and composition. Scientists can actually create a seed that is an absolute duplicate to a seed produced in nature. Their seed has the same size, shape, and chemical composition. If you placed the seed next, a real seed next to a laboratory seed, you couldn't tell the difference. But when the seeds are planted, the difference becomes clear. Both seeds can be planted in good soil and both can receive plenty of sunshine and water, but only the seed produced in nature will germinate and grow. The seed produced in the laboratory will merely rot away. The process involved in the transformation from seed to fruit seems to still be a work of God. No farmer, no scientist, no philosopher can clearly explain how a dead, dormant seed can produce life when buried in soil. Yet, within an hour of being sown, within an hour of being sown, the outer husk of the seed begins to swell because it's drawing moisture from the soil. Within just 10 hours, the chemical makeup of the seed begins to change. And often, in less than 24 hours, the seed sends a tiny root downwards and a tiny stalk upwards. A puzzling mystery. The seed produces life in that short of a time. So in the gospel seed, is the same way. When the gospel seed is sown in a prepared heart, it is a mystery that that seed begins to germinate. Something happens in minutes or hours, sometimes it may take years, but there is life within that seed, and it will begin to germinate within the heart. When it does, new life will come forth it's a puzzling mystery how simple words, simple stories shared, received into the human heart can bring about so profound a change. Yet, all of us who have experienced it know the power of the gospel when it touches the good soil of the heart. We cast the seeds into the hearts of men and women, often without any immediate visible results. Even though we cannot see the process, the seed grows. The seed goes through as it begins to grow. We can sow the seed in confidence, knowing that God is in control of what the seed becomes. We're responsible for the sowing, the watering, and the waiting in faith. God alone is responsible for germination and growth. We can rest assured that the gospel seed will accomplish everything God intends for it to accomplish. Thus we sow the gospel seed with absolute confidence. It prospers according to God's sovereign plan. 
Now, I found a story online that gave me some hope. In fact, I think it would give any pastor much hope. The story goes like this. A pastor served a country church for many years. He had faithfully <coughs> preached the word of God and had regularly visited and witnessed in the community. His ministry in that church spanned many years, but there was little fruit, very few new members. Eventually, the old preacher died. He went to his death convinced that his ministry in the little country church had been a failure. A while later, the church called a new pastor. The new pastor preached the same gospel the old pastor had preached. But an amazing thing happened. People began to come to hear it. A revival broke out, and many of the people in the community came to know God. As they testified about their experiences, the people shared one thing in common. One new member after another testified and said that it was the faithful ministry of the old preacher that God had used to awaken them to their need of a faith community. All the farmer did was cast some seed into the soil. He went about his business and a secret work took place. While the farmer went about his day-to-day -day activities, the seed germinated. The little plant pushed its way to the surface of the earth. The sun favored the little tender plant with light. The heavens gave the plant rain. The soil provided its nutrients. The plant grew. It matured and in time brought forth fruit. When the harvest was ready, the farmer entered the field and gathered his crop. He really did very little, but he reaps all the benefits. Never think for a minute that your witness for Jesus is in vain. You cannot see what God is doing. God is working behind the scenes and beneath the soil of hearts to bring the kingdom here and now. Never give up. Never stop telling a lost world about a saving Christ. Never allow the world to silence your witness for Jesus. Keep telling them about him and trust him to do his secret work in the hearts and lives of others. You never know the barren life that you have been sowing seed into might just spring to life one day. You might go to school, work, or church and see that person profess a faith that has changed him. You might get to watch that person push away from the earth, grow tall in Jesus, and bring forth fruit to the glory of God. Some people ask me if I ever get discouraged about the lack of response we all see. I will admit there are moments when the flesh is weak and I get a little down and out because of empty pews or a general deadness among the people of God. But for the most part, I understand my duty to sow and to water. If the Lord chooses to let me Reap a little here and there. It thrills me to no end. The business of saving souls is God's business, not man's. I can preach as good as I am able, as hard as I please, as often as I have the opportunity. But I cannot save a single soul. If I am faithful to sow and water when I am given the chance, the Lord will take care of the saving in his time and in his way. I am not wasting my time when I stand before a crowd and preach Jesus. I am merely doing what he called me to do. You are not wasting your time when you tell your friends 
family and acquaintances about the joy Christ has given in your heart. You're simply doing what the Lord called you to. Your job and mine is not to save them. We are to tell them. Just tell our stories. The saving business belongs to the Lord and the Lord alone. Don't forget the power in the seed. Some time ago, archaeologists dug into a pyramid tomb in Egypt. In the tomb, they found several jars of seeds. These seeds had been buried with the deceased person 3,000 years earlier. Those scientists took the seeds and planted them in good soil. They watered the soil and waited patiently. After a time, those ancient seeds germinated, and tiny plants pushed their way through the surface of the soil. Those tender plants matured and produced fruit. Isn't that amazing? When the seed found its way into the right soil, a secret work took place, and life came out of death. Such is the power of the gospel we preach. Your job and mine is not to save anyone. Our job is to tell the story, our story, <coughs> and let God work the divine wonder of using us to build the kingdom of God here and now in ways known and unknown. Through God's Spirit, it will be done. Amen and amen.